The spirits followed him everywhere. He awoke in Cass's apartment in Ukrainian village to a world of great noise in his head that drowned out sound and blurred his other senses and scarred his reason. And he believed he was deaf and ran around the rooms holding his head and pulled at his face and moaned. The cars outside sounded like locomotives and someone incessantly banged on the door with a hammer, he thought. And it was her, Cass, wrapping the pain with her knuckles. She had come back from the store with more chihuahua cheese and was barking at him through the glass. He needed a key to unlock the door from the inside, but couldn't think for the noise, let alone find it, and she made no mystery she wanted to come in. And he ran around in his pants, which fell down, and he fell and held his head for her to see when she came around through the back. She didn't care what pain he was in. Her dress had holes in it from a cigarette she dropped that burned through it. This seemed acceptable to them both at the time that the apartment might have risen up in flames and taken the building down with it, and them to hell, as there was nothing forbidden in the expansive contagion of fearlessness that had taken hold of them. In the course of the day, the rain came, and his senses and hearing returned and the storm dampened the western window sills. You surviving, she asked. The cars don't sound like trains. Your voice is sweet again, Cass. Looks like I'm going to make it. What do you think it was? Not your typical hangover. Can't blame it on the wine. Painfully heightened sensitivity. The world was crushing me. Should you see someone about it? A doctor? I don't think so. I can't believe I ruined this dress. Her cigarettes were lost in a very small and dark space in the apartment. He didn't care. And when she couldn't find them, she suspected him. He was on her couch with a pen, the cat laying on the desk chair, when she stormed in with her clothes on. I want you to leave. You don't fucking care. He looked up from the paper where he had written as many words as he had scratched out, with incredulous written all over him. She was pointing to the door. Parliament's more important than me, he asked. She made an evil face. Cass, come on, he said. Break out of it. Do you love me well? Can't we have something less contrived? Don't ask, don't tell policy here. Don't ask policy. I cook you breakfast, she stomped her foot. The cat raised its ears. What have I not done? It's that crush of yours, that Bella. She and I are friends. Just be your own person. Don't try to compete. It's a turnoff. Not everything's a competition. But you're marked with her scent. I can smell her on you. God, Will, you're thinking about her, aren't you? I can't stand that I love you. There was a time I would have let myself go. You pulled out. You can't just pull out and pretend it never happened. The seed is in me, Will. You're not. Tell me you're not, he yelled, pulling his hair. I'm not pregnant, Will. It was just a metaphor. You planted your love in me and it's there. Fuck, he grabbed his head. Don't do that to me. You can't be trusted, Cass. God damn. You fucked around on me. You've hurt me. You've hurt your sister. You hurt yourself. You're so hard to love. You're like a, like a cigarette. You can kill a man in years, burn down a house in a day. But you look nice. You're fun to play around with. You seem cool, but you're not. She stared at him, then laughed and pet him on the head. That's so cute. You're so cute. Like a little dog cute. You poop in the house, but you're so fuzzy. And that little pathetic look on your face could crush an angel. She came out of her frustration and apologized and asked him to stay. He thanked her with some Zeppelin turned up to dance to together and candles lit on the mantel. The cat gave up the chair for her after she went to the bureau for a knit shirt and there found the missing pack. She apologized. They took the long-awaited drags off. There was love in her eyes and flowers in her hair.